exerts its greatest power over the Earth once a fortnight at full and new moon when its orbit lines it up with the Sun and their gravitational effects are combined. Nowhere is its power more vividly seen than in the sea and in the lives of some of the creatures of the deep. The cycle is not just fortnightly. Its effect rises to two peaks in the year to produce especially high tides at the spring and autumn equinoxes. As the sun and the moon join forces to draw the sea into a huge tidal wave that sweeps around the world, the animals react, timing their lives by this cosmic calendar. Where the Indian Ocean washes the northwestern coast of Australia, the Cape Range Peninsula is a strip of semi-desert pushing into the sea. The white beaches and tropical climate of Coral Bay make it a popular destination for holidaymakers looking to get away from it all, far, far away. But these blue waters hide an annual event that most people have never seen. These sheltered white beaches are the product of a fringing coral reef 300 kilometers long, known as Ningaloo. The tropical climate and low rainfall here produce the warm, clear water that coral needs to grow. But one year in March, the water wasn't clear at all. It looked polluted with soft red granules that were washing up on the tide line. Close inspection of this pink soup was to lead to an amazing discovery that changed the way people thought about how coral animals breed. The turbid water was devoid of oxygen. Fish died and rotted on the shore. Holidaymakers called local radio stations to complain. But biologists began to put two and two together. The red slick slopping up the beaches was animal in origin, the spawn of Ningaloo. Quite how it appeared was a mystery, as was its connection with the moon. The scientists reviewed their knowledge of coral biology. Coral reefs, like most other marine organisms, are affected by the tides, which are driven by the moon. They teem with life, fish, worms and sea snails, all living among the stony pinnacles and petals of the coral. From time to time, whale sharks cruise in over the reef. At 18 meters long, they're the largest known fish. In spite of its fearsome appearance, a whale shark feeds only on plankton, tiny floating organisms. The gentle sharks are seen on Ningaloo, usually in March, around the time of the full moon. They cruise the shallow water for a few days and are gone. Was this a clue to the coral's strange behavior? Coral has become familiar, not least from films like this, but its beauty never tires. The intricate limestone forms are built up slowly by millions of tiny creatures related to sea anemones. Each colony starts from a single larva, released from within its parent's body. This had been thought to be the common method of reproduction, but that was about to change. A few species of coral were known to spread by producing spawn. Occasional bundles of eggs and sperm which are fertilized in the open water before they drift away and settle about a week later. During the day, the little coral animals called polyps remain withdrawn, safe inside their limestone fortress. At night, they emerge to feed.
In March each year, Ningaloo becomes infested with predatory worms, rapid swimmers which swarm around the pinnacles, feeding on what? No one knew. But in the year following the red tide, they were about to find out. The worms are joined by tiny fish in shoals too dense to count, feeding furiously as they dart about like gnats. Nighttime brings in other shoals of mirror fish glinting as the moonlight catches their silvered sides. So it was that as the sun set and the moon rose that March, biologists prepared to dive on the Ningaloo Reef to see what was happening beneath the dark waters. The highest spring tides had passed and the sea was entering the neap part of the tidal cycle when the water levels vary least. Beneath the surface, an eerie moon glow bathed the coral heads as the divers entered the water. One small block of coral was producing spawn, small globular bundles floating lazily to the surface. The divers had seen this before, but they were quite unprepared for what followed. Another nearby coral head was also spawning vigorously. And another in a steady stream of drifting packets of living coral larvae. Soon they realized that huge areas of the reef were spawning together, clouds and constellations of spawn rising from many related species of coral simultaneously. Far from being rare, this synchronized mass spawning is now known to be the way in which most corals reproduce. Once a year, the warm, dark waters come alive with the seed of new reefs. This is what brings the great gliding whale sharks to the reef in March and the whirling blizzards of predatory worms, an annual feast on the coral's birthday. The worms are spawning too, triggered by the abundance of food. Releasing the coral spawn at night on a neap tide ensures that there are fewer predators to eat it and that it stays together to drift out to sea, increasing the chance that some of the larvae will find a suitable place to stop and grow. Where predators are at work, it is to the prey's advantage to multiply, swamping the appetite of the predators so that some at least of the prey species survive uneaten. When dispersal of the species is the aim, better a blanket attack. An individual larva might fall to the bottom only inches from a suitable place to settle. If it's part of a crowd, its neighbor might strike lucky. So clouds of spawn drifting on ocean currents provide the coral's best strategy for survival. As the night wears on, the production of spawn becomes less. The corals are preparing to close down for the approaching day. A few jellyfish move amongst the spawn, 
but their appetite can have no impact on the vast numbers at liberty in the ocean. By dawn, the spawn has drifted to the surface to form slicks in which it will travel out across the Indian Ocean. The larvae might travel 50 or 100 kilometers before they settle to seed another reef. But that was not what had happened the previous year. By some freak accident, the coral spawned a few days too soon while the spring tides were still flowing. The pale slicks on the surface, instead of drifting out from the shore, were carried inland by the tide. Instead of heading out into deep water, they floated over the shadows of the reefs where they were born. In Coral Bay, the shallow water was striped with slicks, and one by one they were washed onto the beach. A sickly sweet aroma filled the air, becoming rancid as the spawn began to die. Then the bacteria that moved in to dispose of the remains used up all the oxygen in the water and fish were asphyxiated. The beautiful beaches were ruined, along with hundreds of holidays, but above all, a whole year's production of coral was lost. The only consolation was that the following year the coral spawning was normal, back under the control of the moon. Swinging halfway around the world to California, the same March moon dictates events on another holiday beach. Beneath the sand where the children play lie millions upon millions of unseen eggs produced on the previous night by little fish called grunion. They come in for the first time on the high tide three days after the March full moon to breed in the sand at the water's edge. Each spring tide during the season, people come to the beach in the moonlight to gather the grunion to eat. They must have a fishing license and they may not use nets or any aid to fishing other than their bare hands. Like coral spawn, the grunion are so numerous that this level of predation cannot harm their chances of survival. The season lasts for six months or 12 tides. During this time, a single female can lay over 30,000 eggs. They breed only at the highest tide line so that it will be 11 days before the water reaches this height again. The females burrow tail first into the sand to start laying their eggs. The males struggle to be the one which fertilizes them, wrapping their bodies round the females so that their sperm runs down to where the eggs are emerging. Each female lays only once on each high tide, returning to the sea when she's finished. As the tide begins to fall, there's a last frenzy when the latest females to arrive finish laying their eggs. When the waters recede, the beach is full of eggs at high water mark, eight centimeters below the surface. The next time they're moistened by the high tide, 11 days from now, they will hatch. The young fish will go to sea to return to this beach in a year's time to continue the cycle. The children playing there the next day have no idea of the wealth of life beneath their feet. Offshore lies Santa Catalina Island, home to a colony of California sea lions. Along with flocks of hungry gulls, they welcome the fortnightly influx of grunion as a rich source of food. The moon is about to bring them another feast. The sea lions eat squid as well from the vast shoals that live in these waters. As the sun sets on the night of the March full moon, they're ready for another of the annual spectacles that these waters provide. So too are the fishermen. Their boats are equipped with powerful lights to shine down into the water. They know what is going to happen under tonight's full moon. The squid come inshore in their millions in March to mate and spawn in the shallow waters around Santa Catalina Island.
They grow to about 20 centimeters long, their pearly bodies changing color in the press of their fellow creatures. A siphon beneath that remarkable human-like eye enables them to move by jet propulsion when they have to. Otherwise, they glide smoothly along, driven by the fluttering fin on each side of their body. In the crush, they can hardly move, but they're here for a purpose. So too are the fishermen. Their lights attract the squid, and the annual catch is measured in thousands of tons. A simple net scoops the squid out of the sea, swings round and deposits them in the hold. Once captive, the squid try to defend themselves by squirting ink. It works in the sea by creating a phantom squid which distracts a predator, but here it's useless. The survivors, and there are millions of them, continue with their once-in-a-lifetime chance to breed. Ripe females betray their condition by changing color, and the males that mate with them turn red in the excitement of it all. They clasp a female, place a small packet of sperm in her body cavity and then hang on for a while. This prevents other males from mating with her until she's left the shoal. The females leave downwards. 20 or 30 meters down, they lay their eggs on the bottom in clumps as much as five meters across. The clumps are glued to the bottom. Each one contains two or three hundred egg sacs laid by 15 or 20 females. The eggs will hatch in three or four weeks and the hatchlings will swim up to the surface to drift like the coral spawn wherever the ocean takes them. Meanwhile, their parents die. This was their one and only breeding season, its timing dictated by the moon and its influence on the tide. Now their lives are fulfilled by the leaving of offspring, which will breed in their turn three years from now. All that's left for the spent adults is to return to the food chain on the bottom of the sea. The eggs are tough-shelled and evil-tasting, sufficient defense against bottom feeders like a torpedo ray. This looks like a recurrence of the same scene. Well, in a way it is, but it's 5,000 kilometers away, off Newfoundland, at the opposite corner of North America. Here, the spent adults are fish, called capelin, and like the squid, they will enter into one breeding season and die. It has never been proved, but many fishermen believe that here, too, the moon coordinates the actions of the fish. In these cold waters, the breeding season is later, starting towards the end of May. For three months in spring, the fish come inshore in huge, dense shoals. The males gather just off the beach, waiting to join the females as they rush inshore to mate. Spawning takes place whatever the state of the water on the beach. Some scientists say that rough water stimulates the fish to breed. In this scrambling mass, there are two males to each female. 
Here, there are no rules about not using nets to catch them. Local people catch the fish on the beach to eat, males and females alike, as a seasonal delicacy. They do little or no damage to the fish population. Like coral spawn and grunion, the capelin are too numerous to be harmed by this low level of predation. But offshore, trawlers once netted them by the ton. At this time of year, the capelin are an essential food supply to many other marine animals. Cod follow the shoals inshore, eating adults and fry alike. Whales and seals take their share of the seasonal harvest. But above all, seabirds, at the beginning of their breeding season, depend on the influx of small fish. The rocky shores of Newfoundland, largely uninhabited, are home to huge numbers of breeding seabirds. Among them, the Atlantic puffin depends heavily on the capelin shoals. In the 70s and 80s, the puffin population declined steadily, but now it shows signs of recovery. Experts cannot agree on the reasons. Some blame pollution, while some look for a disease among the birds, but many thought that overfishing of capelin may have been the main cause. Now that the birds can find them again, the capelin provide a timely supply of food for their young. But puffins must compete for their catch, not just with humans, but with almost all the fish in the sea. Puffins are expert fishermen, but they can hardly be expected to outdo cod and salmon in their own element. When capelin are in short supply, some of the puffins must go hungry. Seabirds are adapted to cope with an erratic food supply. Many young birds die in a bad year, but the adults live a long time. They can wait for a good year to produce the two surviving chicks needed to maintain the population. The bird's problem comes from the unbalanced sex ratio of the breeding capelin, twice as many males as females. The main market for the human catch is Japan, where the female roe is a delicacy. To catch enough females to satisfy the demand, tons of males are caught and have to be dumped. The Canadian authorities now impose a strict quota on the capelin catch at around 30,000 tons per year, including the dumped males, and there are signs that some puffin populations are increasing in the maritime provinces. The puffins are just one of the many species whose lives are governed by the response of marine animals to the tides. Capelin and corals, squid and grunion, and their long chains of dependence are all subject to the power 